Good evening to those on the video. Um, so tonight, our topic that we, we have to look at is these two women, particularly Deborah, but we're going to see how Jael um, fits into this story in a very powerful way as well. Obviously, there's, um, there's multiple sides to this story as well, and that includes um, Bayrak. And we're going to come to Bayrak just at the end, but that's not, he's not going to be our focus uh, tonight so much, but he definitely has a lot to teach us as part of this story towards the end um, as well. So just before we get into the story of Deborah and uh, Jael, let's just think for a second about leadership itself from a scriptural point of view. So I'm just going to ask you to call out, um, list off or just shout out or put your hand up um, some of the key leaders that come to mind. When we look at the Old Testament in particular, who comes to mind when we think about leadership? Yes, yeah, so definitely Moses, classic, right? Joshua, yeah, David, Abraham, Josiah, yeah, Hezekiah, good, Hobab, <laughs> yes, that's right, amazing, so he's kind of like uh, in the shadows, but he's a, a classic leader of that, uh, of, the, of the group of the Rechabites, so very good, Zerubbabel, yep, Nehemiah, classic, right? He'd be in the top five as, pardon? Daniel, Daniel? yeah. So yeah, the list could go on, right? Um, when we list all those people, and it's, a, it's an interesting exercise to do when we think classic Old Testament leaders, it actually is drilling down to what, what are we actually seeing as leadership in the Old Testament? I mean, what is our definition of what true leadership is, not just for the people of God, but for the brotherhood in the 21st century that we live in now. What, what is leadership all about? How does it work in our ecclesias, in our brotherhood, um, on the ABs, um, Sunday school, ecclesial outings, just general ecclesial life? What are we looking for? And uh, what do we mean by leadership? See, what typically, typically comes to mind when we talk about leadership is, is the person out in front, Right? And, the, and all of those people were fantastic leaders in some way or another. And obviously God used them. But we typically think of leadership as the person like Moses in front of the whole nation. Is saying, follow me. This is where we're going through the wilderness. Or David on the throne as the leader. But what we want to just think about tonight is that question of what it is that makes a leader in scriptural definition. That's certainly one element. But none of us mentioned a sister in that list. I mean, some of them might have come to your mind, but they're not, they don't set, tend to stand out as the classic illustration of leadership that we might tend to, uh, tend to go towards. But if we're honest with Scripture, brothers and sisters, we will see that God's definition of leadership is quite a lot larger than just the David leadership from a throne point of view or a Moses leadership from... Uh, kind of leading the people through the wilderness point of view. Do you know, the issue of leadership is a prevalent issue from Genesis to Revelation, for, from uh, the perspective of God's people. And uh, when we come to the book of Judges, the whole book revolves around the question, at least in part, of leadership. That's the issue in the time of Judges. L let's just illustrate that. If you've never quite looked at it through those glasses, it might be helpful when you are doing your own study in Judges. It's sort of apparent, of course, but we just want to articulate that, that Judges has a lot to do with questions revolving around leadership. Look how the whole book starts, Judges 1 verse 1. The opening phrase of Judges tells you that the nation is in a quandary for leadership. This is the opening phrase. Now, after the death of Joshua, there's the leader, and he's gone. Moses is gone, now Joshua is gone. Now what's to be done? It came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? That is the opening question of the book of Judges, and it rings through every single chapter. 
And the question is leadership, and it comes up over and over and over again. So, verse 2, the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I've delivered the land into his hand. So he chooses Judah as the lead tribe to enter them into the land. And so, of course, Judah goes up, and things start off remarkably amazing, don't they, in Judges? Um, Judah calls to Simeon, and up they go. And verse 6, uh, they basically take Adonai Bezek and cut off his thumbs and his toes. I mean, they're charging through with all those kings and everything uh, with Adonai Bezak in verse 7. Look at verse 8. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And, and then you read about Caleb and his, and his daughter Aksa, interestingly, who's in that opening chapter. And she shows this amazing tenacity to stand for what God wants the people to stand for, their inheritance. So it looks like Judges starts off on this amazing uh, kind of, with this amazing energy of leadership, but it all comes to a grinding halt. And the turning point, of course, is in verse 19. It's worth marking. So the Lord was with Judah, full stop. And they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland, because they had a chariots of iron. No way. We can get the people on the high land and up out of the valleys. And Judah was there leading as he was chosen, designated by God in the opening um, phrase of the whole book of Judges. And, and we're told that Yahweh was with Judah, but there was no way that Judah could stand up to the chariots of iron. This was new. This was a fearful thing. And if you stood up on the high kind of the high country around the hills of that area, um, up out of the valley, you would look down and you would see clusters of iron chariots kicking up the dust, just cruising through the valleys, right? The Jezreel Valley and everything else. And that put terror into the people of Israel. So was God with them or not? And of course he was. This isn't a comment on the fact that God couldn't take on the chariots of iron. This was a comment on the faith of this leader, the tribe of Judah, to believe that God could actually take them on. So that's the context. And as we go through chapter 1, things just start to deteriorate. They didn't follow out God's command. The leadership just starts to crumble in this, in this uh, opening chapter of Judges. And from then on, Israel struggles to find proper leadership. And we know that as Judges come and go. Well, that's the context of the story of Deborah and Jael. And it's, it's directly so. If you hadn't noticed, come to chapter 4, where we read. Chapter 4, verse 1. So, it, it always sort of seems to start when this person was dead, things fall apart. The leader's gone. Ugh. Look. This is a throwback to chapter 1. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Heresheth Hagoyim, or Heresheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. So that's, this is telling you, it's going right back to the initial problem of Genesis chapter 1. It's the iron chariots. And the faith of these people are seriously challenged by looking at that technology from Jabin, king of Canaan, and his commander Sisera. They, they, can't, they can't come to grips with the fact that God can destroy a chariot of iron like he can overthrow a horse. And so that's going right back to chapter 1. And that's where we find the context of the story of, Je of Deborah. This challenge of unbelief and the people lacking a leader and, uh, and falling apart because there is none. But you know, brothers and sisters, we might be tempted to think that the, the message is sort of saying, well, people do need a leader that's out in front, that can pick up um, the jawbone of an ass, or that in the case of Shamgar in, in chapter 3, verse 31, all he had was a pointy stick. But you think about it, it seems to be saying that this is what we need. But this story of Deborah and Jael is going to tell us, no, that's actually not what it's all about. 
Leadership amongst the people of God starts with people believing and trusting and knowing the word of God and having it in their heart and loving him. And they don't need to be someone who's leading 5,000 people. They need to be first people that trust him and believe his word. And this is what Deborah teaches us. It's absolutely amazing what she's like. So let's just have a look at that. Leadership's gone. There is none. There's no Joshua. There's no high priest. Um, they're all gone. What do you do when no Joshua is present, when no leader is actually leading? By the way, there, and we'll see this as we go through, there were definitely males around, but none of the males were stepping up. Okay? And we'll have a look at that. So let's have a look. This is, this is why verse 4 is so powerful now in chapter 4. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, and each one of these phrases is significant, was judging Israel at that time. Now in what sense was she judging Israel? Well, we're told in verse 5. So let's just have a look at that. She would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel, and we're told where that was, in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now, there's so many extraordinary things with that little verse, brothers and sisters, that we just need to think about, because this verse sets the stage for telling us what Deborah's like, her attitude and her approach. First of all, have a look. She would sit under the palm tree of Deborah. Now, that's telling us, I don't think she named it or tacked a little sign over the palm tree. And by the way, this was probably a date palm tree, not like those tall skinny ones you see around Adelaide that kind of, you know, you might see on the beach in Vanuatu. These are probably, this is probably a serious date palm. And she didn't, I don't think, had a little sign tacked over it. But this is a, a, a tree where, we, where everyone in Israel knew that this sister goes there and sits there. Now, that's amazing, brothers and sisters, for a couple of reasons. And one is, why did she go to a palm tree? I mean, if you were judging Israel and you suddenly took that upon yourself, whatever it was, whether it was God designated or suddenly people started to recognize you in that position, where would you normally go if you were judging Israel? Of course, the, the, the logical place and the scriptural place that we learn about as we read through is actually a judge should be sitting in the gate of the town. Now, there's problems with that this time we learn later that, that um, a lot of that is broken down in the cities of Israel and the judges are not actually doing their job in the gates. But if anywhere, Deborah should never be under a palm tree. She should be down in the gate. That's where everyone used to go. That's where it should be. That's sort of how it worked back then. But she refused to go to a gate, brothers and sisters. She was not a sister, and this is what we see so powerfully from her. She was not a sister that took it upon herself to put herself on top of Israel. As in, this is my position, I'm going down to the gate because I'm a prophetess after all. I belong here. No, Deborah was completely self-effacing. And we know that because she sat under a palm tree. Now you think about that that people from all over Israel came up to her for judgment. It, it must have been something that was just spread through word of mouth, that there is a sister who is, who's been chatting up by this palm tree. You, you got to go up there and talk to her. She knows her Bible inside out and backwards, and God is clearly speaking through her and with her. And that would have spread all around. You imagine, like, for some people in Israel, that would have been a multi-day trip. But they're going to the palm tree of Deborah. And imagine that, going with your family or your kids packing up and saying, you know what, we've got this question that's arisen in our family between some sort of an inheritance or something. We don't know how to solve this. There's no other brother around that can really give us an accurate description of what the law of Moses says. So we're going to the palm tree. And they pack their bags and they go up to the palm tree. And there might have been, I don't know, was there a little tent set up because people would come from all around and waiting their turn to talk to Deborah? Probably. You just imagine that little scene. And all it is is some random palm tree in the middle of who knows where. In the mountains of, where was it? The mountains of Ephraim. And they're coming there to talk to her. You know, brothers and sisters, that says so much to us. And one of the things that I feel really strongly is that we have a brotherhood need to make sure we strike the balance 
in who we're encouraging in our community to do Bible study. And Deborah, with all the force of a prophetess ordained by God, is telling sisters today that the word of God is what everyone depends on individually, not just brothers, not just the heads of families or the heads of the homes or the leaders in the ecclesia from a, a public speaking point of view. The word of God is for every person. And, and God's community, in the, and we can see multiple examples of this in the past, God's community is one that should have sisters as well as brothers who know the word of God inside out and backwards and can teach it to people who have questions. That's exactly what Deborah is teaching us. This, this isn't a sister who, I mean, she was married. She had a husband. We don't know anything about him. Uh, apparently he was uninvolved. We can't make a judgment either way, can we? Because the word of God doesn't. But we just know nothing about him. But what we do know about her is that she passionately read her Bible and loved it. That's an amazing example from this sister. And that's, uh, we have nothing in this record that sounds like Deborah's putting herself on the people of Israel. We have every indication to realize that her reputation as a Bible student is what changed this nation and made people come to her. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a challenge for sisters. And I, I get it, um, you know, talking to Kate and other sisters uh, before, my own sisters, that family life is busy, especially when you have kids. I didn't realize that, you know, six or seven years ago when I first gave the study, and sisters are kind of like, what does he know, this young guy? <laughs> but I get it, okay, I was probably out of whack back then. But, but just understanding that a, a general passion for reading the Word of God and putting it on in your house when you're, when, you're, when you're doing stuff during the day is going to be something that can get into your heart and soul more than, you know, um, endless episodes of, of whatever you might have as an alternative to, to listen to while you're doing the ironing or working at home or whatever it is shifting kids about. All of those duties are, are things that we need to see in the light of the Word of God and His counsel. And we need to inject it into our lives as much as we can. You know, I just saw, I heard um, a sister talking recently, uh, and she was saying, I just thought it was cool. She, was, she happened to be at home. I don't know, not all sisters are at home necessarily. She was at home, and she was just raving to this other sister about a set of studies that she'd been listening to um, recently by another brother in another country. And she just had it playing in the background. But that's the, that's the sense that we, we need to have that spirit and not leave it. And maybe you don't, and that's, that's so good. But Bible understanding is not left for the brethren. And when your husband's doing study at night for Bible class, if you can, and the kids are in bed and things are just calmed down, then pull up your chair and do your study too. We've tried to do that at home. I, mean, I get it, it doesn't always work. But we um, put our study in place to try and make it so Kate had a desk and I had a desk beside her. And we could do that together when it, when it worked out. So we're encouraging that level of Bible study amongst our sisters, not just our brethren, amongst our young sisters, not just our, our young guys. And that's, that's a lesson that's so powerful from Deborah. Do you know that simple fact about her? This whole chapter and story in Israel revolves and hinges on that one fact, that this was a sister who loved the word of God. Without that, this wouldn't have happened. This was a sister who loved the word. Now look at her approach as well. I want to show you this. This is absolutely fantastic. And not to bring up the issue, but just to mention it in passing, Deborah's been thrown around as this, this, this example of woman's lib and, and someone who doesn't quite fit what Paul seems to be teaching in the New Testament as total rubbish. You watch what happens. It's amazing, her approach. Deborah's approach to Barak, right? Look at it. Verse 6. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, now, we've got to follow this carefully about the sequence of events. It said to him, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded? Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun. And against you, now she's, she's quoting God, and she's talking to Barak, right? Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded Go and deploy troops and so on. And against you, verse 7, I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, and his, um, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. Now, 
That tells us something really important that I'd never seen before, brothers and sisters. But clearly, God has appeared to Barak before he appeared to Deborah. So Barak was wherever he was. He was actually in Kadesh of Naphtali. And at some point, God had appeared to this brother, this man, and said, you know what, you need to get up and you need to deploy the troops and take them and take on these chariots of iron. Now, the implication from the record is, is that Barak, Barak got that revelation from God and didn't act on it. And so what's happened is, God then goes to Deborah, who's sitting under the palm tree, and comes to her in a vision and says, Deborah, I've talked to Barak already. This is the command I've given him. Can you please encourage him? And she does. She calls for him. She comes up. And as a brother, you might think, you know, Barak standing before Deborah, she's sitting there and you're standing. And she's like, um, Barak, hasn't God appeared to you in a vision and said that you need to, to get on with taking on these chariots of iron? Now, she didn't stand up and say, you know what? What are you doing? We've got a whole nation here that's been persecuted for 20 years by these chariots of iron. You need to, as a brother, Get out of your slackness. Get up and get going. That's not how she approached it, brothers and sisters. She said, hasn't the Lord God of Israel commanded you? And Barak would have been pricked by that. See, her approach is so powerful. She uses that same expression again. Not, Yahweh has told you, so what are you doing? It's Barak. Look at verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Sorry, into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? And the sense of that must be like, he's definitely with you, brother. Do not hesitate now. Off you go. And he does. And this brother takes that as encouragement from her. And you can tell by his response that that's the tone in which she did it. So here's a, here's a sister brother in sisters who's in a very tricky position in her ecclesia. All of the brothers around her have dropped the ball. They're not leading and directing the ecclesia in the way they should. There's no faith being engendered in these people by these leaders that should be leaders. And Deborah as a sister can see this and she doesn't take the podium. What she does, it gets right in there with her passion and love for the word of God and pricks the conscience of the brothers who should be leading and says, look, hasn't God said that this is your role? Like, this is what can happen. God will be with you. That's her approach. It's absolutely positive and absolutely humble and amazing the way she takes that. So there's the spirit of Deborah and her passion for the word of God. Do you know, her objective then is this. Deborah's objective, and sometimes we get this a little bit off kilter when we read this story, or at least I did in the past. Deborah's objective was not to judge Israel. And you'll notice that as she sings part of her song. Deborah's objective was to get the males to do their job. And that is absolutely clear from chapter 5. You look at this. It's absolutely beautiful. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, sang. Now I'm going to stop there for a second because I have a title in my Bible that's wrong. And I can't remember what it says in the King James, but my title for chapter 5 is that this is the song of Deborah, and that's completely wrong. This is the song of Deborah and Barak. They sang it together. We're told that in verse 1. And we often refer to chapter 5 as, oh, it's the song of Deborah. No, this is the song of Deborah and Barak. And uh, the way they interact is quite amazing. I want to show you, I want to show you this. Um, well, I'll give you the structure first, and then we'll come back. Have a look. I'll just put these up. I shouldn't have them clicky. Is that on there? Ah. This is how I reckon the chapter is broken up, brothers and sisters. You can have a look, um, but I think it's true that this is how it works. In verses 2 to 9, I believe that this is Deborah singing. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, someone's personally speaking in verse 3. Have a look at that. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, I, even I, will sing to the Lord. Well, who? Who's actually singing to the Lord? Well, from our reading, what's the clue in this section? Who's actually personally singing? 
What verse spells it out? What's the verse in this section that tells you exactly who's singing? Verse, oh yeah, okay, verse one is, this tells you that Deborah and Barak have both part of this song, but this section of the song, who's, verse seven, the clue is, right? It says, until I, Deborah, so she's referring to herself, I, Deborah, rose as a mother in Israel. Now, I believe she sings all the way down to verse nine, and there's some reason in the Hebrew, but also just in the context, to say there's a break from verse 10 to 12. This, if you look at it, this seems to be the words of Israelites singing back to the people who are now starting to take up the leadership in Israel. Look what it says, verse 10. Speak, you who ride on white donkeys and who sit in judges' attire. Now, the people who did that typically were the leaders of Israel. So you've got this chorus of people, it seems, singing to the leaders and saying, yes, those who ride on white donkeys and sit in judges' attire, who walk along the road, far from the noise of battle and, and all those things, they shall recount, verse 11, the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts of the villages of Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Now, it's amazing. It seems like these people, suddenly when these chariots are destroyed in chapter 4, there's this song and Deborah starts it off, and the people join in as an incitement and say, yes, the leaders are actually able to go into the gates for the first time in 20 years. And do it. Teach us the word of God. Recount the righteous acts of God in the gates. And they say in verse 12, awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captors away, O son of Abinimum. Do you see what's happening? It seems like the people are saying back to Deborah and Barak, yes, like here we are finally at this stage of leadership in Israel. And then I believe, quite possibly, that Barak takes up the rest of the song. And there's a couple reasons for that. He does refer to himself in the third person, it would seem, if it's true in verse 15. But so does Deborah. So if they're singing it together, they're doing that as well. But the only person who would know the details of verses 13 to the end is Barak himself. He was the commander of the army. He saw what happened with Sisera in great detail. He knew exactly which tribes responded and which ones didn't. All of these are details that likely Barak would have put into poetry to fill out the rest of this song. So this truly is the song of Deborah and Barak. And the people join in as they typically did in many types of Jewish songs. We see evidence of that in the Psalms as well. So that's a cool, um, cool is probably not the right word, that's a, an amazing way, from my perspective, to see that chapter. Now, we want to look at some of the content of it. That's the structure. Look at the content. Look what Deborah says in her section. This is amazing. Verse 2. This is her opening line to the song. When leaders lead in Israel, this is the New King James I'm reading, when the people willingly offer themselves bless the Lord. Do you see her focus? So this is what the New King James says, what I read to you, when leaders lead in Israel. This is the opening line of the song. NIV says, when the princes in Israel take the lead. Um, I'll just mention there that uh, Kyle and Delich say um, for the phrase, um, when the people willingly offer themselves, it could be translated for the fact that the strong in Israel put forth strength. Do you see the focus of that verse? What Deborah's saying in her opening line of the song is that she is so thankful that finally the people who should be leading, like Barak, are actually leading the people in godliness, and they haven't been for 20 years at least. That's, the, that's what she is so passionate about, and you never see Deborah take the reins after this song. Because what's been fulfilled in Israel is exactly what her passion was. And that is that the brothers stand up and do their job and lead people in godly ways. And it was the fault of the brethren in this story, brothers and sisters, that made people have to go to a palm tree in the mountains of Ephraim to find advice, the whole of Israel. They should have been going down to the gates. Um, this is also what it says. Have a look at verse 7. Verse 7 in the New King James says, Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel. Rotherham says this. It, this is a really tricky verse to translate, apparently. 
But this is what Rotherham says on verse 7. Totally different. There was a failure of rulers in Israel. That's what Rotherham says until I, Deborah, arose. Now that fits way more with the sense of this chapter and the song and Deborah's whole objective. So Rotherham says, there was a failure of rulers in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. So that just says so much about Deborah, brothers and sisters. This sister wasn't looking to lead the army. She wasn't looking to kind of um, be the one like Athaliah. Remember we saw her two weeks ago? Athaliah is totally different. She's like, give me that throne. I'm going to kill anyone else so I can be the top dog. And Deborah's like, no, all I want to see is the people who should be leading to lead. Because that's how God has put it. And that's what we need in our nation. We need people in the gates. This is really important. We need people in the gates recounting the righteous acts of God. Not necessarily just someone out leading the battle like a Joshua or Moses, but fundamentally, we need people in the gate talking about the word of God and absolutely loving it. That's what she was all about. I reckon that's absolutely beautiful, her attitude. Just by the way, have a look at verse 8. This is her comment. They chose new gods. Then there were war in the gates. So she's very, very acutely aware of what's happening in the gates of Israel. It should have been judgment, but there was war in the gates and confusion. And look at the people, like we just said in verse 11, say, the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. In other words, they don't have to go to the palm tree anymore. When things are set right, the people will go to the gates and learn the word of God. And yes, um, faithful brethren will be there teaching. Faithful sisters will still be around the nation of Israel teaching as well, but at least it's set up how it should be, and they'll eventually be able to go to the gates, and that's what they were excited to see. And that's why Deborah never sat in the gate herself. She was waiting for those gates to be restored, which is pretty amazing. So, of course, there's another woman in this story, and that's Jael. And uh, we're not going to look in detail at her, but um, she was... Uh, really, really courageous, as we know that. The thing that always is stuck in my head, when I was a teenager, I, I was listening to a talk, sitting in the front row, which probably wasn't a good idea, by Uncle Jim Cowie, on this. And Uncle Jim Cowie just went really excited about jail and acted the whole thing out in front of us. His veins were bulging. Don't record this. And he was stomping up and down and, and reenacting the whole thing. And I remember as a young kid, like, whoa, this is amazing. And it is amazing. The, the courage that's there and her faithfulness to actually carry something like that out is enormous. But what's amazing about her, brothers and sisters, is she did that all in her kitchen. That's amazing. That she defeated the, one of the worst enemies that Israel's had over those 20 years in her kitchen in her little tent. And she never even left the tent to do it. She just had such rock-solid faith that when the opportunity came, she would never, ever waver. This is the spirit and the faithfulness of Jehoshabeth. What she stood for in her house, that's where her family was going, even though her husband was a drop dead. Okay, he, was, he totally committed treason. He hopped on the other side of the fence and he gave the whole plan away to Sisera. Nice husband. Think about that, brothers and sisters and sisters. Having a husband in that position. Think of the excuses that could be there. Yeah, that probably put restrictions on her about how, she, how far she could go and how much she could mix with the faithful brothers and sisters. But she was at home reading her Bible, getting text messages from Deborah. I don't know. Some sort of communication because they definitely knew about each other. And I don't know how, but they definitely did. That seems to be what the story says. So there was some sort of commonality between these two sisters, a love of God. And when the opportunity came, she was not going to let anything into her house that compromised her values, even though her husband was the way he was. That is an awesome sister. And the, the type of sister that changes the game at an ecclesia, in the brotherhood, in the nation of Israel. Simple, solid faith. That's the type of leadership she had, right? This wasn't a sister who was out in front, nor was Deborah, really. This was a sister who just had rock-solid faith and kept building on that day by day, despite the iron chariots that were bothering her brethren. And that made all the difference. Her leadership was intensely valuable, and God used it. 
You know, something beautiful about these two sisters, I'm, I'm not sure if you've noticed this before, but it just makes me, uh, it's just amazing every time. Uh, did you notice in chapter 5 when it's describing poetically what she actually did? Look at verse 25. I love this. When, when Sisera came in, he asked for water. Right? So she would have had water in the tent, almost certainly. Right? So he, Sisera came in all puffed out. He's run all that way. He knows he's, he's in a losing set. He's going to hide in this tent with his sister. He has no idea what he's just walked into. But he says, please give me a drink of water. She's like, I'll get you a drink of water. And she gives him milk. Now, the milk that she gave him, right, was in a, like, brought out cream. The King James says butter, right? I think, is that right? King James says butter. So I don't think she brought out a block of butter because it didn't have toast or anything, I don't think. But I think what, what it's saying is the Hebrew is that this really creamy, yummy milk. That's what, he asked for water and she comes back and says, no, no, I'll give you the best. This is milk. It would have been goat's milk. Absolutely, they didn't have Jersey cows walking around. There was goat's milk. She gave it to him. Why did she do that? Why do you think she did that? Okay, yeah. So, um, now I've only learned this by experience recently that Ellie goes to sleep. It seems a lot better when you give her a little bottle of milk at the end and she's all calmed down and docile and pop her into bed just before she wakes up again. So, yeah, the milk seems to calm her down. And maybe that's what Jail did, right? She was giving him milk. No, I'm going to make you real snoozy, okay? And she gives him a really... A big, a lordly dish. Have all you want. So it would have relaxed him. Oh, he's safe. She's treating me well. That's all part of her faithful actions. Have you ever thought, when you put those two women together, two women are at the heart of this story, saving Israel from the foreign invader. This is what you find. So Deborah's a bee. We know that, probably, from Sunday school days. Her name means a bee. Oops, that's not up there. Sorry. Her name means a bee. And uh, interestingly... She's uh, sitting under a date palm that's full of sticky honey, not, not necessarily bee honey, but the word that is used for that sticky dates and for honey is the same sort of thing. It's like a honey coming out of there. So it's like Deborah sitting under the palm tree. She's a busy bee, okay, yes, but it, she's giving out this, this honey. And if you look in Proverbs, and we won't do it now for the sake of time, but you look it up, Proverbs on a number of occasions says, when you, when you want a metaphor for when one friend gives, uh, I say, gives counsel and advice and, and soul-speaking words to another friend, it's like the sweetness of honey. And that's what it is. That's what Proverbs says. So that's what Deborah's doing. She's sitting under the palm tree, giving out honey, these sweet words of counsel and advice based on the word of God to the entire nation. She's the bee, giving out some honey. Uh, jail means a wild goat. And uh, together with Deborah, the two of them are protecting the land of milk and honey. She was giving goat's milk. There's no doubt about that. It would have been absolutely goat milk. They didn't have cows back then as we do now from the grocery store. So here's, here's just an amazing little parable. Whether it's designed or not, I, I tend to think it is. There's this beautiful story going on where there's two sisters in their rock-solid faith standing up against the world around them are protecting and standing up for the land of milk and honey that was flowing. That was what it was promised to in the beginning. They were going to go in and they fought for that. That's what the spies initially realized when they went in. And here's these two sisters providing sweet honey providing refreshing milk. And there they were, working to protect under faith by God's guidance the land of milk and honey. Do you know, there's something else rather staggering about this chapter in chapter 5. And that is another female character. And it's, it's almost, uh, you could almost say this is one of those sections in scripture that is comical. It's really actually makes you kind of like, what? And uh, it's verse 28. Verse 28. The mother, now, why on earth does the song that's so elevated and amazing end on this? The mother of Sistra looked through the window 
So we've created this little vision in our heads, a little scenario of what's happening. And this is what it is. The mother of Sisera looked through the window, and she cried out through the lattice work. And this is what she says. So you get this really pathetic picture of a mother looking out the window. She's pushed over looking through the lattice work, and her son is Sisera, and she's saying, what is she saying? She's crying out, why is this chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his, of his chariots? And, and she's got her wise ladies around her, right? She would have. She would have been in a high-ranking high position. She's got her widest, wisest ladies around her. Wisest. It's almost like a, intended to be pathetically contradictory. Her wisest lady answers, ladies answered her. Yes, she answered herself. Oh, I know what he's doing. He is finding and dividing the spoil to every man, a girl or two. For Sisera, plundered of dyed garments, plundered of garments, embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter. It's just this really sappy, pathetic ending to the song where this mother is looking for a son. Where is he? He's always home sooner than this. The last 20 years, he's won every battle. And he... And her ladies come around and comfort her. So you can see the tears coming down her face. As she, and you know why it's taking so long? Because he's getting presents for you. He's going to bring home the real nice stuff this time, all those embroidery and stuff. And they're all sitting around, and they would have had all their fancy stuff on. That's where they were completely focused on. Why is that even there? Well, she's called the mother of sister and brothers and sisters. And I can't help but think that that must be a complete intended contrast to verse 7. There's two mothers in this song, and you couldn't get more different mothers. One was a spiritual mother in Israel, and the other one was a pathetic mother of a materialistic family and son who had nothing to do with God. This is, this is not the type of mother in verse 28 that would give the counsel of Proverbs 31 from two weeks ago. But Deborah certainly was. You can see Deborah saying every word of Proverbs 31 to people that would ask her. Do you know what's significant too, isn't it? That Deborah, when it says in the song, I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel, she didn't say, I arose as a leader in Israel. She did not say that. She said that I arose as a mother in Israel. I love this people. I care for them. And I will do anything I can to help that nation back on the right track. She was a true mother in Israel. And do you know, brothers and sisters, our ecclesias are so greatly blessed by our older sisters who have that spirit, of course, as contrasted to the spirit of the mother of Sisera. You know, I can honestly say from my, especially as I grew up in my younger years in Canada, there's, there's definitely two or three sisters in particular that stand out in my mind as older sisters. And they're the type of sister, no matter how old they were, and we had heaps of them in my ecclesia, for some reason there was a lot. Annie, Kurt, Connie, Gertrude, there was a whole lot, we loved them all. And they would come up to you after meeting and give you sometimes a stale lolly or something. That was fine. But they would talk to you about stuff. And one of them, her name was Annie Linda, and she still does it today. And any time there's a talk, if you go out and talk to Annie Linda after the talk, she'll have so much to say. Her Bible's open. She's been writing and scratching notes all during the class. But, but she's adding to the ecclesia this intensely beneficial spiritual dimension. And the young people get excited by that. And she's 80-something. It's amazing. And, and sisters like that make an impression and can really help spark things in the ecclesia. It doesn't mean that you have to be someone who knows all the lexicons and dictionaries back to front. It's just someone who has been reading the Bible and is willing to just say, what do you think about this? Or um, put it that kind, thoughtful word that's based on the readings for the day or something that she that she's been doing, doing during the day. That's the mother in Israel, all right? And we love, we love that in our many sisters um, that contribute in so many ways related to that. And that's encouragement to keep doing that and to become along those lines. And that's the sense in which Paul, I think, exhorts sisters in the New Testament. There's these two mothers, and they're so entirely different. So you think, brothers and sisters, in particular sisters, what, what's the message from Deborah in jail to sisters? And clearly it must be that Bible study and loving the word of God is your job too. 
And we know that. I, I, I'm not trying to be condescending or anything. I just think it's worthwhile remembering that, encouraging each other on that note to get out our Bibles and to look at it for ourselves in those sisters' classes that we do on your spare time, whenever it is, even though life can be so hectic. It, it means talking about it too, doesn't it? It means that when we do come to meeting, that's what we're talking about. We've got something from during the week that we've looked at and say, you know what? What, what about this verse? Have you ever seen that? I, I personally feel, brothers and sisters, and I'm at fault too, but I personally feel our ecclesias don't see enough of that after Bible class on Wednesday and after meeting on Sunday or during the week and the phone calls that are made. It's uh, the lessons of supporting and encouraging each other to participate and get involved. That's what she did for Barak. Supporting the brethren in their lo- role of leadership. Not being complainers, but getting in and being positive supporters, even though sometimes, often, brothers don't do it right. You know, it's true that not all sisters necessarily have a great love for cooking and for doing things like wiping kids' noses. It's just not coming natural to every single sister. And uh, Deborah is just a good encouragement that there is other elements in terms of what a sister's life in Christ is all about. I just thought I'd read you this. I, I know where um, I'm just conscious of time. But this is something that I, I'm going to point you to to look up on your own in more detail. But this is a little writing from uh, Uncle Robert Roberts in Seasons of Comfort, Volume 1. He wrote an article called Spiritual Ignorance and Woman's Position. And this is a little bit of what he said. Sisters are never likely to develop into noble servants of Christ if the door is shut in their face by a theory which would consign them to cradles, pots, and pans. I do not mean to suggest that cradles and pans are incompatible with higher duties any more than hammers, shoe lasts, or baking troughs, troughs? of their rougher brethren. But a doctrine that would tie them all the time to these is an offense and a mischief. Now this is something that's worth for brethren to hear too, isn't it? The balance of scripture. It is the part of true nobility to shine in the performance of the humblest duties. We will not say stoop or condescend because there's no stooping in the case. These humble duties, which are the most important in the economy of life, become exalted in the hands of intelligence and worth. But to insist on confining sisters to these would be to ignore the fact that they have brains as well as bodies, and that men have other needs of help meet ship besides those of a knife and fork. Such a boorish doctrine would destroy companionship where brethren need it most, and unfit their wives to fulfill the highest function of motherhood, which is to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now that requires a spiritually cultivated mind to support the husband, support the family, and to drive it in that direction. Now he goes on to say, I won't quote the rest of it, but he goes on to say how how Jesus esteemed sisters in their role too. And I think that's just really encouraging to realize that we need to develop in those ways too, all of us. That's the encouragement that comes from the likes of Deborah. Do you know a, a little quick message when it comes to Barak in his position in this story? Barak, obviously, we know, is reluctant when he is called to lead. And it's Deborah who conjures up or helps to develop that faith in him. And finally, he's ready to do that, and he acts. But you think of all the, all the brethren in this story, brothers. There's Lapidoth, and he's just basically not involved, as far as we know. So that's one type of leadership, in quotation marks, just not being really involved in stuff on the side, maybe not doing anything helpful. Then there's Jabin, and his mistake was that he was just power hungry. That's his leadership style. Sisera, his leadership was totally misguided, leading but in the wrong direction. Heber, another male, well, his leadership was compromised and weak. He took the easier route to join others and wasn't willing to join the people of God, even though it was hard. And Barak, he was reluctant, but that brother developed in faith and became strong. So the questions arise, don't they, as, as brethren in the Ecclesia, how are we currently reading, uh, leading? Not just out in front, let's not make that mistake of just thinking that that's leadership, but what's your focus in your personal life and the impact that that makes on other people, your family, your wife, your Ecclesia? What focus do you bring to your group of peers at the Ecclesia, no matter how old we are? Do we lead by example? If we don't, the whole Ecclesia suffers. And that's worth 
thinking about from Barak's point of view. You know the awesome little thing in verse 9? Just have a look as we close on Barak. This is what she says to him, and I, I just think it's worth noting as a little side point. She said, I will surely go with you. Absolutely. Nevertheless, you know, think about this, brethren. This is what the sister's saying. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, Barak could have responded saying, really? Like, I'm going to organize this whole army and take on the, the chariots of iron and there's not going to be any glory for me in it? I'm done. But her wording and the way she was and her faithfulness rubbed off on Barak. And he develops. And he says, yep, I don't care about glory. Who gets the credit? Who gets noticed? I'm doing this for God and the people of Israel. And that's his spirit. And the same spirit is in Deborah. That same thing. That's a good little message, isn't it, brother? For all of us. To just remember that, that service is not about glory. It's about God. And service to others. So yeah, you might not get noticed, right? For cutting the grass. Or doing other sort of little jobs around the ecclesia that all wear off on the spirit and culture of the ecclesia in a positive way. But it's about serving God. Let's close on this verse. And this is what Barak closed on because this is what he learned. Have a look at Judges 5, verse 31. This is the final little verse. And this is an extraordinary verse. This is how he finishes. Thus, let all your enemies perish, O Lord. But let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. Do you see the picture that he's created? It's all about leadership. He's been this sun that's been hiding behind the clouds the whole story, or at least at the beginning. And he's seen tribes, if you get a chance later on tonight or tomorrow, read chapter 5 again about the response from the tribes because a lot of them did exactly what Barak did in the beginning. They just were like, "Eh, I don't know if I can do it. And Barak's learned the lesson. He says, no, if you really love God, then get out from behind the clouds and shine in full strength. Shine before your brothers and sisters. Lead by example, not just in front, but if you really truly love him then throw your life into it and let your faith depend on him. That's the spirit of Deborah. That's the spirit, brothers and sisters, of leadership in scripture that Christ shows us. And that's the leadership that Deborah demonstrated as a sister. And that's the leadership that Barak learned as a brother. So let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength.